So welcome everyone to this webinar on the right to education in Iran. We're delighted to be hosting this event on Human Rights Day in partnership with the Raoul Wallenberg Center for Human Rights and the Montreal Institute for Genocide and Human Rights Studies. My name is Corinne Box and I serve as the Director of Government Relations for the Baha'i Community of Canada. So let's start with some opening remarks by three exceptional individuals who have dedicated their lives to promoting and defending human rights. They are Kyle Matthews, the Honorable Senator Mombina Jaffer, and the Honorable Irwin Kotler. Kyle is the Executive Director of the Montreal Institute for Genocide and Human Rights Studies at Concordia University. Senator Jaffer represents the beautiful province of British Columbia in the Canadian Senate. And Professor Kotler is the chair of the Raoul Wallenberg Center for Human Rights and was just recently appointed Canada's special envoy on preserving Holocaust remembrance and combating anti-Semitism. Um, I know that Kyle Senator Jaffer and Professor Kotler may not be able to stay with us for the full duration of the, of the, of the program. And so I'd like to thank them now rather than at the end of the event for their encouragement and their unwavering support. For those of you that may not be so familiar with the situation of the Baha'is in Iran, Kyle has accepted to offer a brief overview. Kyle, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Corinne. And it's a great honor today to, to be with you to talk about um, the plight of the Baha'is and to be uh, speaking with Erwin Kotler and Senator Jaffer. Uh, it's a great honor. Um, and on behalf of my colleagues at the Montreal Institute for Genocide and Human Rights Studies, uh, we think this is a very important event uh, to be part of, um, and I think nothing is more important than highlighting that education is not a crime, it's an actual human right. And, and today uh, we're going to be talking about, um, about um, a religious minority group in Iran that's really mistreated, and, um, and the world does not know much about it or, or hasn't taken as much action. So I'd like to first start off and say, you know, in most countries around the world, Baha'is practice their religion freely. In a few, they face challenges they are working to resolve through ongoing dialogue with government authorities. But in the country of the birth of their faith, Iran, the challenges are much more pernicious. So in Iran, uh, which is a theocracy that doesn't have the best human rights record and imprisons um, all sorts of human rights activists, uh, we, we see that the treatment of religious minorities is, 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 is terrible. Um, in Iran, the Baha'i are excluded from social, economic, and cultural life by the law of the state. Their children are harassed in schools, they're banned from higher education, and are blocked from access to public sector employment. Um, many are denied business licenses and have their shops arbitrarily closed. Uh, marriages are unrecognized, graveyards are destroyed, and government propaganda inculcates a widespread prejudice against them in the wider population. It, it really is a human rights crisis. Uh, and the policy of the Iranian government is to destroy the Baha'i's community as a viable entity. Uh, it aims to accomplish this by denying them all fundamental rights of citizenship. Iran has incidentally exported this policy to Houthi-controlled Yemen, where its tactics are being replicated. And this is, I think, frightening to me to see a state that is not just worried about persecuting or trying to persecute a minority group in its country, but is exporting that to war zones um, in Yemen. Um, it's truly, truly disheartening. Now, the Baha'is have been persecuted by having almost all their citizenship rights removed by the state, they are treated as non-citizens. In fact, the Iranian government claims that they have religious freedom because they can believe what they want to in private, in their homes, but they are just not allowed to organize themselves, maintain social institutions, or manifest their beliefs in public. This is total opposite to Canada, where we celebrate diversity, we celebrate religious freedom. It's squashed and destroyed in Iran. And the response of the Baha'is to the situation has been peaceful and constructive. They have created innovative businesses and enterprises that provide employment. They have initiated social service projects that build friendship and understanding among their neighbors and communities. They have created their own informal arrangement known as the Baha'i Institute for Higher Education or the BIHE to educate thousands of young people excluded from university in Iran. Um, truly it shows a willingness to create and, and, and come around problems the state puts in to, to block it from blossoming. So I think I look really forward to hearing all the other panelists today. This is going to be a fascinating event um, to hear from people who, who have suffered this in, in Iran, and we'll hear from other leading experts. Um, so with that to do, I would like to...
pass the floor. I know Senator uh, Jaffer was to follow me and I see that she's here. So I'd like to pass the floor and ask Senator to deliver her opening remarks. Thank you very much, Mr. Matthew. And thank you very much for having me here today. It's uh, always a pleasure to work with the Baha'i community and the Baha'i organizations in Canada. Um, today, my uh, urging to all of you who are Canadians is to, um, uh, to push our government to do more. Um, we as Canadians sh um, must make our, the power we have is with our own government. And yesterday I asked a question in the Senate uh, of the leader of the Senate and you know, uh, I was not happy with the answer. And so I want to give you a little bit of a background for those, almost all of you will not know me, but uh, uh, I am a great fan of the Baha'i community. And I learned about Baha'is when I was very little. There was a Baha'i temple being built in Uganda and my father had built many temple, uh, many mosques in Uganda. And so they asked his help in building a Baha'i temple. And on Saturdays and sometimes even on Sundays, he would take me where the temple was being built. And my dad was so much in awe of the faith of the Baha'i people. And he would say, imagine, just imagine if the whole world believed what the Baha'is did, we wouldn't have wars. They believe in all faiths. They believe in Muhammad, they believe in Jesus. They believe in all kinds of faiths. And you know, and they, they really are the faith, faith of the future. And that has stayed with me forever because I also think what so many wars would not exist if we were following the Baha'i faith. So I come to you with that knowledge and that absolute um, uh, uh, education that my dad gave about the Baha'i community. And I've always felt that I would love to have been in Baha'i. And I often go to Uganda and I go, go visit that Baha'i temple. And whenever I go anywhere else, of course I have been to the, the Baha'i temple in, in, uh, in Israel and also in, um, uh, in India, and, and I always look out for Baha'i temples because I have this absolute joy and love for the temples and what it stands for. But I want to talk to you about something more. And that is, I used to be an, a refugee lawyer. And when the Baha'i refugees came to Canada, my job was very easy. It wasn't a big case I had to present to the Canadian government. All I had to show was the person from Iran was of the Baha'i faith, and they would be immediately accepted as a refugee in our country. Because our government knew, our government knew the terrible persecution Baha'is have in Iran. Our government was aware that it was important to welcome the Baha'is. And you know, I am one of those refugees, not a Baha'i, but a refugee. So I know what it is like when you are welcomed into a country. And Baha'is were welcomed into our country. I want this government of ours also to welcome Baha'is to our country. But you all know that we cannot all, all Baha'is do not want to come to Canada. So we have to speak out for Baha'is in Iran. We all know the terrible persecution that is happening against the Baha'is in Iran. Now as a Muslim woman and a practicing Muslim, I want to tell you, I am not proud of what the Iranians are doing in the name of faith. I am not proud of it, and I'm very angry that they use my faith, my faith,
to persecute another faith, a faith that believes in all religions. And so to all of you, I reach out to you and I say to you, if you have taken the time to attend this session, you must take the time to write to the prime minister and say to him that yes, even during the pandemic, when Baha'is are being sent to prisons, they are being persecuted and being sent to prisons in Iran, it is important for our government to stand up for the most persecuted people in the world. It's a real honor for me to be here with you today. And I want to tell you, I will always be there to support the, what you are going to hear today. Because we as Canadians cannot shut our eyes to persecution. I know what persecution is. In Uganda, my family was persecuted. We were given refuge here. But as I said, not everybody wants to come to Canada. And Canada's role is to join other countries who have spoken out against the persecution of Baha'is in Iran. Please join with me and let us make our government more accountable for our brothers and sisters in Iran. Thank you very much. I welcome you to this uh, to, today to this event. And I also thank you for having me today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Jaffer. I understand you have to rush to another meeting, but thank you so much for those, those heartfelt uh, comments. Thanks. I will stay for a few minutes now and then go. Thank, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Professor Kotler, vous avez, uh, c'est votre tour. Merci, uh, Corinne. I'm delighted uh, to join Kyle uh, Matthews and my former delightful colleague, Senator Mabina Jaffer. Mabina, it's so nice uh, to see you. It's been uh, too long and appropriately enough to be coming together in this forum on the right uh, to education, which is the most fundamental of human rights and one which has particular resonance with respect to the pain and plight of the Baha'i. This forum takes place really at an important moment of remembrance and reminder because we're meeting in the immediate aftermath yesterday of the 72nd anniversary of the uh, Genocide Convention, reminding us of horrors too terrible to be believed, but not too terrible to have happened. The Never Again Conventions, as it has been called, but which has been tragically repeated uh, yet again, again and again. And as been mentioned on the 72nd anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the Magna International Magna Carta of Human Rights, as it has been uh, called, but which has also regrettably been violated in every one of its uh, particulars, including, tragically, the right uh, to education, which is, Carl Matthews put it, that education is not a crime, it is a fundamental uh, human right. Two years ago, the Rao Wallenberg Center for Human Rights, which I chair, published a paper uh, titled Realizing Rights Over Repression in Iran. We sought to document and detail the assaults on all sectors of civil society uh, in Iran, uh, women, environmentalists, uh, religious leaders, students, trade union leaders, and the like. And at the time when we did it, I wrote in the preface, uh, because I recall the Soviet uh, dictum that used to say, uh, and, and was really brought into play, uh, where the Soviets used to say that, uh, and act on that, because they would arrest uh, prisoners in the summer, prisoners of conscience in the summer, on the grounds that, and this relates to what Mabino was saying, that vacation time in the West is prison time in the Soviet Union. So they would use the summer for their mass arrests, and they seek to implement that Soviet dictum, give us 
the person and we will find the crime. Regrettably, the summer of 2018 uh, witnessed a massive assault on uh, human rights in uh, Iran, targeting the leaders of all the uh, groups uh, that I mentioned. And this uh, brings me to uh, the situation now, today, uh, in Iran, which is only intensified uh, under the uh, COVID, under the cover of the COVID pandemic. So we're witnessing at this point, as we meet, not only a global COVID pandemic, but a global political pandemic, which is characterized by a resurgent global authoritarianism of which uh, Xi Jinping's uh, China and Khomeini's Iran are metaphor and, and message. And where we've witnessed not only assaults on fundamental freedoms of belief and expression and association and uh, assembly, those things that so much underpin uh, the fundamental freedoms of the Baha'i. But we've also witnessed an assault on media uh, freedom. And again, under the cover of the pandemic and where prisoners of conscience are really a looking glass into what has been uh, happening. And uh, here with regard uh, to the uh, Baha'i, this past summer of 2020, we have seen really the criminalization and intensification of that, of the fundamental freedoms of the uh, Baha'i, of the denial uh, and increased arrests of those involved in giving expression to the right to education, in the arrests of those who seek to do nothing else but to protect and to exercise rights guaranteed under the Iranian constitution and under international treaty obligations that the Israeli and Iranian authorities have assumed. Accordingly, I was pleased that parliamentarians from all parties uh, this past summer, and that included you know, Senator uh, Jaffer, came together to condemn, as they put it, the targeting of, of the Baha'is for persecution, of the threats to quote unquote, uproot the community by, as made by Iranian officials, including in particular officials in Shiraz, about mass arrests in Shiraz and other uh, communities uh, in Iran, of the re-arrests and new uh, prison sentences for those who had been released, and of a state-orchestrated campaign of hate uh, uh, targeting uh, the Baha'is in thousands of articles and, and posts and the like. And so I join my uh, former uh, parliamentary colleagues in calling and join Senator Mabina Jaffer in her calling upon uh, the government for an, to bring an end to the persecution and, and prosecution of the Baha'i community, to call for the release of all prisoners of conscience, for an end to the state orchestrated media campaign of hate and def defamation targeting the Baha'i, and uh, to protection and safeguarding of the rights of the Baha'i, not only for the Baha'i themselves, but really for the benefit of the Iranian community as a whole, for the betterment of the human condition as a whole. May I close with the words of uh, Del Deloria Bershon, the chair of the National Spiritual Assembly of the Baha'is, who in a recent gathering of uh, faith leaders from all communities uh, together uh, with the prime minister, where she said, we need to see each other and act as one united human family. This must be the message that emerges from us today on UN Human Rights Day. And this must be the responsibility of the Iranian leadership to partake of one united human family and put an end to state-sanctioned discrimination and targeting of the Baha'is and protect their rights as guaranteed under the Iranian constitution, as I said, for the betterment of the Iranian people as a whole and for the betterment of the human condition as a whole. Thank you.
thank you all for your passionate comments. And uh, again, thank you for your uh, unwavering support and your encouragement. You're great friends to us and it's deeply, uh, deeply appreciated. Now we'll move to the second part of the program and I'd like to introduce you to Laura Friedman. Laura is our media officer extraordinaire and she will be moderating a conversation with three panelists who have offered to share their experience and their research. Lara? Thank you, Corinne, and thank you to our sponsors. Um, as Corinne mentioned, my name is Laura Friedman and I am the media officer for the Office of Public Affairs of the Baha'i Community of Canada. But before we begin, I would like to uh, start by introducing our speakers. So I'll start with Dr. Shakib Nazrullah. Shakib obtained his BA from the Baha'i Institute of, for Higher Education, also BIHE, in Iran. He moved to Canada in 2007 to start his master's in counseling psychology. And in 2009, upon completion of his master's at McGill University, he returned to Iran to teach at the BIHE. Two years later, Shakib was arrested by Iranian authorities because of being a Baha'i and for his affiliation with BIHE. He um, left Iran in 2013 and started his PhD at McGill University in counseling and psychology, in psychology. And he finished this in March of 2020. So right now, Shakib resides in Quebec and practices as a psychologist and is also an editorial board member of Azu Magazine and an advisor to the BIHE. So we're happy to have you here, Shakib. And our next speaker, Tulu Golkar, obtained her Bachelor of Science in Biology from the BIHE in Iran in 2007. She completed a Master's of Science in Cancer Cell and Molecular Biology at the University of Leicester and returned to teach and be a member of the BIHE Biology Department from 2009 to 2014. She then started her PhD in Biochemistry at McGill University in 2015 and is a member of the Affiliated Global Faculty of BIHE. Happy to have you here, Tulu. And finally, Kimya Misagi, who currently works as a researcher for the Department of Law and Legal Studies and for the Chair of Teaching Innovation at Carleton University. She is currently conducting a study that's um, entitled An Exploration of How Resilience Combats Oppression Among Minorities, a case study of the Baha'i Underground University in Iran for her MA thesis. And she has interviewed alumni from the Baha'i Institute for Higher Education to learn about how they have responded to systematic persecution. So thank you all for being here with us today and I'll just dive into it. So Shakib, um, I was wondering if you could briefly describe your experience trying to pursue higher education in Iran and what was, what was it like to then study with the Baha'i Institute for Higher Education? Oui, bonjour à tous. Merci beaucoup, Laura. Et je suis très heureux d'être invité à cet événement sur un sujet aussi important. Um, I want to start by saying that uh, during my childhood and high school, I was never a good student. I had very bad grades and um, I hated the school. I, uh, and that's the truth. Um, and I, I, I didn't have uh, good self-confidence at all. And I, I don't think still I have much self-confidence. Um, and for, for, for several years, I was you know, not sure what, why is that? And um, looking back, I realized that uh, I, was, uh, I was not having a good time at, at school at all. I, I was bullied. Uh, because of being a Baha'i, I, I, I would hear horrible stories uh, frequently uh, retold by our teachers at school about how they slaughtered Baha'is uh, in their cities and villages. And uh, I, I had to hide, uh, you know, uh, my religion and um, because it was, it was not correct to, to, to be a Baha'i. And therefore, I, 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 I never connected with uh, school. And even still right now, I have some, some weird feeling going to 
any word that is called school. And you can imagine that I, I have a doctorate right now. And, 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 and it's, it's, it's still there, that feeling. So, you know, growing up in that condition, knowing that my sister uh, was also expelled from high school because of being Baha'i, I didn't have much hope. So the combination of, uh, you know, not having hope and this instilling so much fear that I felt uh, personally, you know, was, was, was intended for, now I realize, for me to, to really set back from, my, from, from any, any educational goal. And as a Baha'i, we knew that we, we won't have any opportunity to, to go to a university in Iran. Baha'is are banned from going to universities in Iran. For 40 years, it is still there. And it's, I think it's a shame to international community that for 40 years, such a thing can happen, continue to happen. So, so what happened was that uh, I knew that this BIHE exists. BIHE is a community initiative, initiative of Baha'i community in Iran, and which in which uh, when 19, in 1990, when 1982, um, 89, 82, all the Baha'i professors were expelled from universities because of being Baha'i. And all university students of Baha'i students, they were expelled from universities. They, uh, they, 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 they gathered together and started this, this so-called you know, uh, university, they call it here underground university, which, which, um, which really served only for Baha'is. And the, it was a response of the Baha'i community to those, to those uh, abolition of those rights. And um, I knew that Baha'i BIHE is there. So it was just the, my, my only hope. Um, now you can see I've graduated from uh, one of the top universities of the world, McGill. And the key bridge to that, from that hopelessness and fear to this position that I have right now, I've attained, was BIHE. And the uh, what happened was that it gave me hope and um, a, a purpose to to uh, to continue and to survive. Uh, when I when I started BIHE, it was in the 2000. In 1999, uh, on a concerted effort, on 8 a.m. in a in a fall day. 500 homes of Baha'is who were involved in teaching it at BIHE and staff support for BIHE were ransacked and attacked by the government of Iran. So a year before I entered BIHE, BIHE was basically shut down to the ground by the regime of Iran. But within a year, BIHE rejuvenated and restarted and they were able to uh, let me in. So I, I started studying and then, um, as, as Laura mentioned, I, I um, finished it. I, I came to Canada. I applied to universities. Fortunately, I got accepted. I finished my master's, went back, and started teaching at the same university. And uh, I got arrested for that. So it's, uh, it's appalling for me to hear that uh, government um, officials outside of Iran say that no one goes to prison because of being Baha'i. I am the living proof that that's not true and that's a lie. So I think I have, I have to stop here. Thank you, Shakib, um, for sharing your experience and for giving us this background about the BIHE. Thank you. Tulu, um, before you came to McGill to start your doctorate, you studied with a BIHE, and then you taught as a member of the BIHE biology department in Iran. During this time is when the BIHE came under attack by the Iranian government, and your residence was raided, and you were sentenced to five years in prison. Can you talk to us about this experience and what has helped you to persevere uh, to continue your studies? Um, well, first of all, thank you for the invite. Um, it's a pleasure to be in this group. Um, well, I can start with uh, many things, <laughs> but uh, as you mentioned that um, on May 2011, 
um, my house was one of the houses that was raided uh, by the agents of the Ministry of Intelligence. Uh, I was not at home. Uh, I was at work um, and my parents refused to call me, uh, although the agents were persisted that they need to call me to come home, but they refused. So um, they ended up um, just confiscating all my belongings and some of the personal belongings also of my family. Well, um, I'm not gonna go to details that I had um, several uh, interrogation sessions, but one, um, one thing in um, my second interrogation was that um, my second interrogation was a bit longer than the first one. And it was like a, in a private um, room, like no one was there besides me and two interrogators. It was like uh, the whole um, few years that I was there and the two people were trying to um, convince me that I am, um, I have the right to educate as a Baha'i. And this is not the truth that Baha'is uh, cannot go to university because they are Baha'is. And um, this institution uh, that has been made by, by Baha'is is an illegal one. And we, I should not continue um, work in that institution. So for the whole, <laughs> I should, I should say like four hours, we are trying to just say, no, you're not, this is not the truth. Um, and uh, it, was, it was kind of funny at the end because at the end, um, one other person who I assume is kind of like a supervisor of those two interrogators came into the room and he just read all the papers and like the answers of my um, questions and then he just looked at me and says, well, of course you don't have the right to go to university because you're Baha'is. If Baha'is are not even entitled to leave in Iran. And I was like, started to kind of like smiling at the other two. And I told them that, well, I think like these past few hours was like the waste of your life because it's apparent that you know that already. So uh, it's like, um, it's just like very interesting experience that um, even they kind of like, um, they're trying to say in the like human rights, um, like sessions and everywhere that this is not the truth, but they know themselves that they do not want Baha'is to live in Iran and stay in Iran. Um, and well, the other um, thing that I want to kind of like go to and the question of yours that like how, what helped me to persevere um, to just come and just continue my study. I actually still think about it because <laughs> um, like um, it's been um, around six years that I left Iran. Um, well, I um, made my decision to leave in our, uh, in to leave Iran um, in about four days, I think. And I think that was the, <laughs> that was the push. It was like a deadline because, <laughs> um, well, I always had this dream of like pursuing my education and I always like looked around and tried to see where would I like to apply and um, well, which country or um, which field. But well, I had my own life. I, ha I was working uh, besides working at BIHE, I was working at a, as a, um, in a private uh, laboratory as a lab technician in a molecular section. Um, I had like um, good friends, good co-workers. I loved my environment of the work. Well, there wasn't any push to go out of this situation. Um, 
But when uh, on April 28th of 2014, one of my friends who had um, the same procedure of court and everything with me um, was arrested without any summons in the early morning. I, that was like a moment that I thought if I want to leave, I need to leave right now. Um, and then I left at May 2nd, 2014. Um, and uh, I should mention that I know that I didn't want to leave illegally. So I thought um, if they arrest me in the airport, because uh, it's usually like when you have a um, court sentence, um, like theoretically your name should be at the all the borders and airlines, and then you should be banned uh, leaving the country. So I thought like if, um, if they want to arrest me, then that's it, that should be it. But if they do not, and if I have the permission to leave, then I need to do my best and just keep it as a gift. So, yeah, so I think um, that deadline of going to prison or not was my push to leave. Thank you, Tulu, for sharing this personal experience. Um, your perseverance is inspiring. And so thank you for being so open on sharing this with us. Kimia, um, you're a graduate student at Carleton University and you have been researching about resilience among the BIHE students in Iran, and graduates in Iran. Um, could you tell us about what you think others can learn from the experience of the Baha'is students in Iran? Thank you so much for your question. Um, I feel very fortunate to be able to share with you some of the insights I have observed from my case study on the Baha'i Underground University in Iran. In my case study, I have interviewed 15 alumni from BIG, all living in North America, to learn more about the intersection of resiliency and education at this unique university. As mentioned, I am a master's student and I have just finished collecting my data and have just finished my interviews with graduates. So everything I say now is preliminary. It is not thoroughly analyzed yet and I haven't fully applied a theoretical lens to it. So with that, those disclaimers in mind, I would like to share with you some of the observations that I have gathered. The first being is that they strive for excellence, meaning that they are not complacent. They have a deep thirst for knowledge and they overcome obstacles as demonstrated by their educational attainment. From my study, a vast majority of participants have attained graduate or doctoral degrees following their education at BIG. If this is an indication of resiliency, then I would say that graduates from BIG are resilient. Although I have not collected any comparative data, a study in the United States that was learning about educational attainment among first-generation Iranian immigrants found that the percent of those that attained graduate or doctoral degrees was half the amount compared to my study. This vast difference brought up some of my own questions around oppression, achievement, and resiliency. Some participants from my case study shared their ideology that when one is deprived of something, that they become more eager to attain it. For example, they don't want me to study, so therefore I'm going to become a doctor. Some were accustomed to hiding their notebooks in rice bags, and this became motivation to gain more knowledge and excel in their studies. They also believed that their education at BIG was a main factor for their resiliency. They nuanced the understanding of what it means to be resilient as the capacity to build, resist, define, and redefine yourself and your experience in the face of injustice, and to endure difficulties and challenges with a hopeful attitude and not giving up under harsh circumstances. An example of this is a student who was completing their research thesis with the guidance of a thesis supervisor. The thesis supervisor was arrested for teaching at BIG and BIG found the student a second supervisor. 
the second supervisor was arrested for teaching at BIHE, and BIHE found the student a third supervisor. The third supervisor was arrested for teaching at BIHE, and finally, the fourth thesis supervisor was able to work with the student until they finished their thesis and could graduate. Another story that was shared was a student had requested to turn in their assignments early. And when their professor asked them why, they shared because they knew they were going to be going to prison and wanted to make sure that their assignments were handed in. These students and this institution did not give up regardless of circumstances. Another point is that they understood the importance of resiliency of an individual, but also the significance of a resilient community. The Baha'i community supported them in their endeavors to study. This went beyond making tuition accessible, but also providing accommodation in their homes of local Baha'is and opening their homes and providing meals during their classes. The Baha'i community as a whole dedicated their time to ensure that these students were educated, whereby coordination, instructors, teaching assistants, administrators, all collaborated so that these students could study. This was all done in a spirit of service where it was all voluntary and while risking their own freedoms. Many of the students I interviewed believed that there was a relationship between the process and content of their education and their own ability to live well in the world. Another way resiliency was demonstrated was in the participants' capacity to have spiritual and intellectual and emotional capabilities. This manifested in them being able to excel in their education and secure a stable career and provide for their families, but also allowed them to have the insights which came from the oppression, to be quick-witted, attuned with the needs of their community and being resourceful and creative to seize opportunities. What I have found is that BIG alumni are sharing that BIG was their sacred and special place and refuge in a society where they are continuously and meticulously and thoughtfully denigrated in so many different areas of their life. BIG provides them with an opportunity to be special in a positive way. For those of you who are familiar with the Harry Potter books, one participant shared how it reminded her of BIG, particularly, particularly because she felt that BIG was her special place to be accepted and to be able to learn and grow just like Hogwarts and Harry Potter. Despite many attempts to shut down their education, such as leaders being arrested and raids confiscating their educational materials, the strength of the community prevailed. So to your question, what can others learn from the experience of Baha'i students in Iran? Based on my research, they are attaining further education and strengthening their resiliency through nonviolent approaches in a high conflict environment. I think others can learn from the experience of these Baha'i students as a model of resiliency in the face of oppression and especially in the face of systematic oppression. The act of going to BIG was an act of resistance. It was an act of the self and an act of a unified community. This approach of attaining knowledge as an act of resistance is very interesting for others in situations, in situations of oppression to think about how their own lives can be acts of resistance towards a better good. Education as a tool to responding to oppression can be applied to a variety of contexts, such as the Black Lives Matter movement and other justice seeking groups. Education is something that no one can ever take away. I asked participants what message would they share to other individuals who also face systematic oppression. One of the participants shared that there are a lot of injustices in the world and we need to work towards eliminating those injustices. Our starting points are not all the same. Some people start at plus 500, some people start at minus 300, and that's the world, it's not fair. But we need to have faith, and instead of putting our energy towards criticizing why we are at minus 300, we need to put our energy towards how we can come together as a community to respond to injustices so we can forge ahead. I thought that th what this participant shared was a very clear and potent description of how to respond to injustice. I hope that the lessons learned at BIG can be utilized for individuals and communities to advance despite persecution. I could continue all day, but I think I will stop there. Thank you. 
Thank you, Kimya, for sharing this research and these insights, which are so valuable, not only for those who are affected by this, but for those who want to understand um, the situation more. Um, should, should keep continuing on this theme of resilience. Obviously, the Baha'is in Iran are under, under a tremendous amount of pressure. This includes economic pressure, social pressure, pressure, psychological pressure. So how have Baha'is responded constructively to these circumstances? Um, I had an others, I and others mentioned that BHC has had uh, many graduates uh, at ma uh, bachelor and master's level throughout the 40 years of, almost 40 years of its existence. And, and, uh, and many of its graduates have, 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 uh, you know, have done very well in outside of Iran as well. And, and why is that? And it's not because BIH had uh, many resources or even a campus or amazing library or skyrocketing funding that other universities have. Um, BIH is a service-based uh, university, meaning that no one gets paid. Instructors don't get paid. Classes are held <clears throat> in the homes of Baha'is. Um, and uh, Baha'i students come from other cities, small villages across the country, sometimes 24 hours on a bus to get to Tehran or other cities to have a class, in-person class, if there are, there are in-person classes. So, so and, and then they, they go to Baha'i's houses uh, without being charged, uh, they, they, they stay there. So, you know, a, a typical day for a uh, for a for BIHE is when when you wake up early morning you have to if when you're in, in Tehran you have to go to another part of the city uh, buzz the door of someone who don't know whom you don't know and the person opens the door to you welcomes you you have the class there and there be then you this you 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 are served with cookies and tea <laughs> and uh, and what is that experience and how that experience is different from the experience of a university in Canada? Uh, it is obvious that that's a community initiative that uh, holds with itself uh, elements of surviving and elements of sustaining itself through community initiative. Um, uh, my mother always hosted uh, students from uh, other cities of uh, Iran who had to come for the classes, in-person classes, some a few runs per semester, and they became my good friends. So all these little things, many houses of people who were uh, hosting as uh, classes, many um, uh, instructors who dedicated their time free to teach, and which is uh, still going on. I mean, I think that I have not heard of such an instant uh, thing in the uh, in, uh, around the world. I know of some uh, examples of underground universities right after or during uh, World War II, but um, not to this extent and um, the, the way it works. Um, so it, it gives hope and uh, support. I'm just going to stop here because I want to use the rest of the time for, uh, for a story if, if I had time. Later. Um, sorry, did you say you wanted to share something or we could? No, just later. Uh, oh. I think, yeah, we were already yeah. behind. Well, um, I wanted to turn to <laughs> Lou and uh, ask about the role that Canada can play. Um, you know, VIHE credentials are unrecognized in Iran and many Canadian universities don't know how to assess them. So what kind of support do you think BIHE graduates need from Canadian universities? Well, um, I know that in Canada, uh, many universities have accepted the credentials of BIHE. Uh, well, McGill is one of them, but like Concordia, Queens, Carleton, um, Ottawa, University of British Columbia, Waterloo, and many others. Uh, so I think that's the first step, but um, I think this step will not happen if um, um, like one of the students of BIHE 
apply for the university and then that university will if it if um it hasn't recognized Baha'i yet, BIHE yet, then that will be the, the procedure will start. So I think um, the first step will be the BIHE students themselves try to apply for different universities. Well, they for sure they can start from the universities that uh, already been um, recognized BIHE, but for um, um, making the list longer, it's better to apply for other places as well. Um, well, in this manner, then it will be um, the help of um, sometimes I think it's, um, well, my experience in England uh, that I had is that I, well, when I applied in England, um, there were already lots of students um, studying from BIHE in England, but the university that I applied, there were never be any BIHE students. So they didn't know what is BIHE, so they asked. Uh, so I, um, of course, explained them in a long email, but also I referred them to other universities that already been recognized and, um, and also referred them to some people who are, um, were, who, who were at that time the professors of those universities and they accepted the BIH students. So they contacted those places and then finally they recognized, they uh, decided that yes, we accept you from BIG and we accept your bachelor degree. So I think it's just a procedure of like both sides. So like the students should uh, have this endeavor to apply, but also here, um, well, other universities, when they got um, like um, maybe some requests from other university to tell them ab about BIHE, well, they need to help and they need to just uh, kind of give them their experience. Um, but uh, one thing I, I thought about it is that, well, I am lucky that my supervisor is a Baha'i. Um, well, Dr. Berkas, who is in the biochemistry department of McGill, accepted me um, at the beginning, for sure, it just because he wanted to help me. Um, and um, well, I, I was thinking that may, there are many professors in different universities all around Canada uh, who are Baha'is. Maybe it will be a good idea to uh, ask them or recommend them to think about BIH students and maybe um, just um, always um, put a place for a BIH students to come and join their team. Uh, I think that would be one from the side of the universities and of course Baha'is in the universities. They can uh, always think that like they can allocate a place in their team for uh, BIHE students. Um, but I also thought like um, the, the students, the BIHE students who are already studying in Canada, in Canada also has a role. Um, for example, I always thought, what can I do as a student right now? And what I am always trying to do is that trying to, um, kind of um, introduce BIHE to different professors at McGill. And I'm doing that by either uh, like asking them to give seminars for BIHE, uh, like as a professors of like uh, outside of Iran. And then they will ask what is this BIHE and then I'll start uh, introducing it. Um, and also, um, by this that I ask, um, I offer to all of the students from Iran that when they apply to McGill, they can give my name that I am already at McGill. And if they want to contact me to know what is it about, I can go and check, I can go and talk to them. And it's already been happened that one of the uh, prof actually called me and then said that I want to see you. And then I want to 
see what is it about BIHE. And I went to his office and we ended up just having a conversation about that. So I think from different parts, different things can be done. So it's always good to think about, um, first of all, our role, and then maybe just recommendation for others. Thank you too. That's very helpful to know and hear. Um, so we have a, quite a few people joining this webinar who are concerned with the cause of human rights. And our time is also short. Um, but I'm wondering if you could uh, share some brief closing thoughts, particularly around how efforts to advocate for the rights of Baha'is in Iran can help promote broader advancement of Iranian society and perhaps your hopes of the future. Some just brief remarks. Shakib, I'll start with you as you wanted to share. I wanted to share a story of uh, an early morning in 1993. It was an early morning. I was a sec one student and uh, it, was, it was during the morning ceremony in which right now happens still in Iran, in which all the students have to stand in line like soldiers and shout, yell um, slogans against US and Israel and other countries. And, uh, and basically exp uh, kind of, you know, uh, explain their hatred for others. Um, this is the message that they're, they're being told to do. And this is for everyone, right? At the end of it, on that particular day, our principal stopped and asked the question to all. I don't know why he asked that, but he asked, is there any minor religious minority student among you today? Uh, because the exams are coming up and there is this uh, particular exam for those who are recognized religious minorities like, like Christians and Jewish people who are kind of recognized by the Iranian regime. And he asked that question. As a Baha'i, I had not told about my faith to anyone in, that, in, that, in my class. So when he asked that question, I was faced with a, with a dilemma. If I raised my hand, people would knew that I'm a Baha'i. If I didn't, I would have betrayed my own beliefs. So I raised my hand, half raised it, and uh, my friend from, uh, from behind said, Shakib, are you a religious minority? I, I, I put it down, I said, no, no, I'm not. And that stayed with me. The shame of it stayed with me. And I felt really bad for a long time. In, in fact, this is the first time I'm talking about it in public. I don't know Tulu, who is my friend, has ever heard of it. And this, that stayed with me. And now if you analyze that situation, the principal had no right to ask that question. The context was hostile against, um, against, uh, against Mingi Baha'i. But there was another component that is so easy to forget. And, that, that, and those were bystanders there. It was one person who would support me from that crowd. One person, one student, one uh, teacher. I wouldn't feel that way. Canada is a bystander to what is happening in countries like Iran. And it's complicit in what will happen in those countries. And the shame of uh, what is going on will be on all of us. So I think two issues are very prominent for government of Iran. One issue of minorities and particularly Baha'is. And second, women's right and the right to have a job or not a job. And these two issues are directly related to the, uh, to the, to the ideology of the Iranian regime. And if, uh, governments, other governments of the world uh, pressure Iran on these issues, the glass house of the Iranian uh, politics and policies will break down if they feel that they are not accepted and welcomed in what they, they in how they treat their, uh, uh, their citizens. If they feel like they're, they're not accepted and welcomed, they will feel pressure and they, they will act on it such as it has happened in the past, and it's, sure, it's proof that the Iranian government uh, officials uh, do respond to the pressure of international community. So it's of course very important that uh, Canadian government 
has put up that resolution for several years uh, to to the uh, to UN uh, has led that resolution, and it has an inf- impact on the uh, on, on on what is happening inside Iran. Um, and I think I want to finish with uh, um, the fact that uh, one of my interrogators used to say uh, that oh your Canadian friends. Uh, uh, they have, they have, they have, they have done this and that, and they're 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 raising your your names and blah blah blah. So you you see that the policies of Canada has a direct impact up to the interrogation room inside a in prison in Iran. Thank you, Shakib, for sharing your story and for this. Um, Kimia, do you have any brief comments? I think to your question. In my opinion, I think it's easy to learn about these human rights violations and disapprove of them, but still be passive. The focused advocacy efforts for the rights of Baha'is in Iran creates accountability for Iran to adhere to and impacts all minority communities that face persecution in Iran. I think any country that accepts their citizens will flourish because they are benefiting from the diversity of thought and experience. Without their full rights to education and equality as citizens, all that's doing is depriving Iranian society of its true potential. And that goes for all minority groups that are oppressed in any society or country. When minorities are embraced and empowered, this contributes to vibrant communities and societies. Thank you, Kimya. And thank you everyone for attending this event and to our sponsors and the speakers. So we'd like to invite um, those who are watching to follow us on our social media channels on Twitter at Canada Baha'i, on Facebook at the Baha'i Community of Canada, and on Instagram at Canada Baha'i OPA. And of course, there's our website Baha'i.ca and the office website opa.baha'i.ca. Thank you. Corinne? Yes. Um, I know we're a little bit over over time, so I'll, I'll make this brief. Uh, Tulu and Shakib, uh, allow me to salute your, your re- re- resilience, your determination and your courage. We all long for the day when Baha'i youth will be able to access higher education and complete their degrees in Iran. Kimya, thank you for sharing your valuable research and your insights. Thank you to our partners and thank you to our respective colleagues working in the background. And last but not least, thank you to our virtual audience for tuning in. Until we meet again, keep well, everyone. Thank you.